celebrated the feast of the mustard seed, the little seed that was very small, the heart, which was from some time to be a great tree that would shade the universe. So the uh, beginning of the new opportunity for regeneration was the resurrection of the sun god at the vernal equinox. Now this was carried over into theology and brought into contact with many different legends and myths in all parts of the world. But in every one of these different systems, the actual sense of the matter was that the human being in his own growth passes from conception to birth, and in passing from conception to birth fulfills the first part of his journey. He then is born, and the birth, the physical birth, is the beginning of the journey through the chambers of initiation. It is at that point that the entity begins to unfold the potential. Here the, the, the small twig of Arcasia is revealed. It is shown that the life is there, <clears throat> that the, in the winter it appeared to die, but it was not dead, it sleepeth, and it comes forth again. And in the life of every individual, when sorrow, misery, destruction, evil things plague the life, make it seem very difficult. By quiet contemplation of realities, we all discover that there is in us the, sh the germ of an immortality that cannot perish. But that when we really desire and start a conscious journey towards truth, at that moment the little seed in the, within ourselves begins to build the inner life for us. The sea, of, the sea becomes the tree of the soul, as it was called by Bemi. So we then start out on all the problems and processes of life, and we are not shown what to do or told exactly. We have the experience of our ancestors. We have three great directives to help us. And one of these directives is observation, to see what is happening in the world. Another directive is experimentation to try a thing and see if it works. The third one is tradition, the gift we receive as a legacy from our ancestors who have passed through all kinds of experiences and problems. If we are able to use these three instruments, they will guide us or guide the sun from the vernal equinox to the summer solstice. It will then bring into play all of the labors of life, for it is from the time of the planting to the time of the harvest that the individual must guard his properties, must sacrifice his time and energy to protect the crop which he has planted. The farmer, therefore, is most busy in those months in which it is necessary for him to prepare for the harvest that is to come. Therefore, in life, young people must prepare for the harvest of the years. Those starting out must build for the future, and in each instance, the, the great uh, supreme power to achieve that which is most necessary or most desired lies in the dedication of the individual to the principles of his religion. Actually, therefore, the ancients didn't have religions just the way we have them. They didn't have so much formalization. Most religions of antiquity were religions of joy. There were very few sorrows in the religions of ancient peoples because they believed so firmly in the reality of good that they even accepted troubles and tragedies as testings of good, of, of means of strengthening. Adversity tempers the steel of the human soul, making it strong in emergencies. And the old peoples of the worlds of long ago accepted many of the problems that we reject simply because they realized they were part of life. So in this part of the testimony, we go back again to the temples, and we find that the disciples take these initiatory vows and begin the journey through the three primary degrees of initiation. And the Son does the same thing in the three primary degrees between the testing of the soul and the entry of the uh, cycle, the Sun cycle, into Capricorn. Here we find three definite efforts made to prepare the individual for the three great steps that he must take later. Here he is supposed to conquer the three parts of himself 
which are subject to the stress of initiation, the body, the heart, and the mind. But the body, he must discipline the flesh until it becomes uh, serviceable as an instrument to give it all care that is necessary. No legitimate system of ancient religion ever tormented or tortured the body for purification. It, they, it was simplified. All the luxuries might be eliminated, but it was necessary to protect the body because it was the contact with the world of experience. And without that, the great trip could not be successfully made. After the body was obedient to the will and to the heart, then the second step was the purification of the emotions and the heart. Here the individual had to generate a new discipline upon the emotional life of himself. He must purify his affections. He must control his appetites. He must have all kinds of hope and, and a positive and constructive emotions. He must gradually overcome criticism. He must cure the causes of neuroses and things of this nature. So that actually uh, the second step in the three steps was to gain control of all pressures which arise through, through illusion and fantasy within the life of the person. Then the third step consisted of the purification of the mind. The mind so that it could be no longer uh, a problem to the life of the person. The purification of thought included, of course, complete overcoming of selfishness, self-interest, pride, all of the arrogances and all of the worldly values which many people cling to so tenaciously. In other words, the mind must be detached from everything which will not survive after the body dies. We have to take with us in the mind only that which is not dependent upon the body, but is dependent upon the insight of the individual himself. Now, having accomplished these three labors over these three signs, the individual uh, has become uh, gradually cleared of some of the problems which we face today, because in these recent times we have lost contact almost entirely with this concept. We are no longer in a position uh, to understand just what all this adds up to. But one thing we do know is that gradually so-called progress has, gra has destroyed the integrity of millions and millions of people. We are no longer able or willing uh, to use the body and the physical embodiment for the improvement of nature, for the strengthening of character, for the extensions of knowledge, and through the birth and rebirth within ourselves of those elements and factors and parts which are necessary to our perfection. We have therefore gradually changed our father's house into a place of merchandise. We have taken it and we have disfigured the entire purpose of evolution. We have failed to recognize the real, real reason for the gift of the sacred year. For a year is a period set aside for the growth of beings. It has something to do every year in repeating and repeating the evidence of what is necessary. The year becomes the great teacher of each person if that person will be observant of what happens during the months of that year. He will also gradually come to recognize that the uh, loss of the memory of the past at cancer when he enters the gates of oblivion is this loss is restored to him at Capricorn and as he brings his life into perfect order the whole pattern of his life will be revealed again he will remember whereas previously he forgot previously he forgot his, huma his divinity and remembered only the humanity that was being born in him at Capricorn he is no longer locked into the memory of material things but restores his memory of the divine world from which he came. So the uh, year is a, is a very great symbol of things, a symbol that we all could do something about. If, however, we imagine for a moment that uh, this whole pattern of, 
this astrotheology does have a meaning that is more profound than we realize. We know that it was protected in one way or another, so that the human being who was not prepared to receive it would not be likely to gain a knowledge which would damage him. But now everything has more or less changed. The old systems have gone away. There are still traces of them, and some very good older systems still function. But for the most part, people today have no consideration for the consequences of action, and they have no realization of indebtedness to the universe, a debt which must be paid by conduct. While this condition remains as it is, we have some of the great tragedies of life. At some time in the remote past, for example, uh, science, which was in the hands of uh, a very exclusive group, not exclusive in the sense of snobbish, but exclusive in the sense of knowing, informed, and morally incorruptible. The, this knowledge was placed in the keeping of persons who had already forsworn all personal advantage, who had, all, <coughs> who had already forsworn any action for profit that was contrary to principle, and, were, and had accepted the obligation that everything that man discovers must be brought to the altar of God. Now, as a result of this type of dis disagreement, and dis discourtesy at the moment, we can take a little look at science. Here we have probably one of the most valuable instruments the world has ever been given. An instrument by, uh, bounded and founded in the great s s triad of mathematics, astronomy, and music. Science which has developed itself in many, many ways and has given us a great number of very pleasant privileges and has made life easier for millions of people. And in this respect has gained our confidence. But we begin to notice something. We notice that the scientist has not taken the obligations that were given in the ancient mysteries. He has not forsworn fame. He has not declared that he will invent only that which will serve good. He does not permit his secrets to be carried out if he is properly informed, if they will bring damage or injury to any other living thing. So what is happening? We have a scientific world which has given us much to be grateful for, but might sometime give us that which will extinguish all the good that science has ever given. This is the type of thing that was a great concern to the ancients, that they will prevent the abuse of the greater knowledge that gradually comes to the human being. This greater knowledge was therefore protected by the rites of initiation the basic rights of three degrees by means of which it was possible for the person representing again the embodiment of the sun uh, to become morally responsible. So in the first degree of the ancient rites were given the first primary purifications. Purification in the mystery system uh, was only symbolized by baptism because the real purification was not given by water. It was given by the divine power of deity itself. But in this first step, the mind, the heart, and the body were cleansed of selfishness and self-interest. The individual became as a little child, seeking truth, realizing that the things around him which he has assumed to be truth are not necessarily true. Many things that we believe are not so. Many things that we disbelieve will ultimately be proven to be true. And in this mystery of uncertainties, it is very much to our advantage to place certain disciplines upon our own attitudes. We may not know yet why we should do it or how we should make these applications, but that something has to happen inside the individual before it is safe to, to, uh, to bestow upon him the wisdom of his race is more or less obvious. There is a great body of wisdom, and there is a great race of people 